So uh, Dr. Casey holds an MS and a PhD degree in entomology from the University of Maryland and UC Davis, respectively. She has 35 years experience in the ornamental horticulture industry. Her interest in developing landscapes to support beneficial insects led to an interest in using gardens to support bee health. And she joined the Hagen Doss Honey Bee Haven in 2012. She manages all aspects of the Haven, including plant curation, outreach, and social media and education programs. Chris also has conduct research to evaluate ornamental plants for their value as bee forage. Without further ado, the, the screen is yours, Christine. Thank you very much. And, and I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you tonight and share some of the work that we're doing at Davis as well as work that, that other groups are, are doing as well um, so that we can all make our gardens as, as healthy as possible for bees. All right. So I'm going to talk um, about building a better bee garden. Uh, I'm going to begin with a little a bit of an overview about the Haven and some of the common bees that you'll see there, as well as probably in your own gardens. And then we'll go on to talk about the things uh, like plants and other components of gardens that really make them as, as healthy as, as possible for bees. So the Haven um, has been in existence since 2009, and uh, I've been there for most of that time. Uh, we received our major funding from haagen hence the name. Uh, they were interested in providing a forum for the public to learn about bees and their role in pollinating our food. And uh, that's, that's where the, um, their interest and why the Haven came about. And we serve to provide information and inspiration for mostly urban bee gardeners, folks who might wanna have their uh, landscapes be a little bit more helpful for bees than they, they might be um, currently. And uh, so they can see the, see the plants, see the bees and, and learn from the, the various classes and other programs that we do. Um, and that includes uh, teaching undergraduates as well as hosting student interns who help with our research. Uh, we do a lot of, or certainly before the pandemic, we did a lot of uh, school group and youth outreach uh, as well as part of our education program. And then uh, we also, as I said, uh, do research on bees and their attractiveness or on the attractiveness, attractiveness of common ornamental plants for bees to give us a better idea of what we can uh, put in our own gardens. So when we think about bees and, and forage, generally um, people tend to think about um, landscape, uh, arc, uh, agricultural settings um, because of course bees are tremendously important for pollination um, and also about native bees in wild habitats. And we typically haven't really thought about urban landscapes as being an important source of forage for bees. But in the last 15 to 20 years, a number of research groups have started to look at, at the idea that our urban landscapes can be really valuable in providing bee forage. Uh, after all, a lot of the turf that we have planted around our houses or, or office parks really is never used for anything. The only time someone walks on it is when it's mowed. So why not turn some of that into uh, forage for bees? And on the left here, I just have an example of some of the more recent studies that have looked at this question and shown that bees can be both diverse in terms of the different species and abundant in terms of numbers in urban settings. And then, as I mentioned at the Haven, um, we extend that message to our visitors through a variety of methods. Um, the Haven is a self-supported organization. haagen provided the funds to get us going, um, but does not provide on, we have, they don't provide ongoing support. And in fact, we have no source of uh, regular ongoing support. So the various groups have donated funds that have supported us with grants that you see listed here um, are tremendously important to our survival. Uh, individual donors play a key role. And then of course our, our de dedicated volunteers who help us to keep the garden in top shape. So I'd like to uh, go on now and talk a little bit about the variety of bees that you typically see in a garden, because it isn't just honeybees. And I, I know you, you all are honeybee keepers, but I uh, think that you're probably interested in some of the other um, 
19,999 species that are out there as well. Um, and in California, we really have a diversity of bee species. We have about 40% of all of the bee species that occur in North America. And I think our, you know, our, our diverse um, geography, which drives our plant diversity, is a, a direct reason for that. And unlike your honeybees that uh, you know live in a hive and are social insects with a queen and workers and a division of labor, most bees are solitary. And of our native bees, about 70% nest underground with the remaining 30% above ground. And pictured here is a valley carpenter bee female on the left and a sweat bee on the right. And these are two bees from the haven. Just to show you that when, within our relatively small half acre garden, um, we see a tremendous diversity of bees. There are uh, 80 species that have been recorded from the haven. And so of course, the, probably the most common bee that we would see in our urban gardens are honeybees, um, both because of folks who are keeping them and because of uh, feral bee colonies. Uh, next up would be the carpenter bees in the same, um, in the APD, the same family as honeybees. And the two common ones that we see in California are the valley carpenter bee and the mountain carpenter bee. Um, the valley carpenter bee is the, the largest bee in North America. Um, the female uh, over on the right is shown over on the right and the male is on the left. And they're about an inch in length um, and um, are really quite, um, uh, captivating to our visitors. They really um, begin to get people, when they see these bees, they, they really start to get excited about bees and interested in learning more. And in fact, the, the males are, are very amenable to being caught and chilled so that you can actually hold them. And, and that's a great um, educational tool to get kids over their fear of bees. Because of course, as you know, the, the males cannot sting. The next most common bee at the Haven are bumblebees. And um, we have um, four different species that have been seen there. And uh, the bumblebee activity has started now uh, for us down here. And uh, again, this is another group that really captivates our, our visitors. Um, it seems everybody loves bumblebees. Uh, another common bee at the Haven that I would guess most of you have in your gardens as well are the longhorn bees. And um, these are um, solitary bees. So you'll see the, the fee, only the females go into the nests at night, which are underground, and you'll see the male and males in sleeping aggregations on plant stems. That's how they spend the, the night. And they're distinguished by those very long antennae, which gives them the name long bee. And then the sweat bees are probably the smallest bee that we see in the garden, as I, I showed you at the outset that comparison of the carpenter bee and a sweat bee. These are a, a tremendously diverse group. There are both social and solitary bees, as well as um, ground nesters and cavity nesters in this group. But these are quite numerous, both at the Haven and in, in many urban gardens. And then finally, the leaf cutter bees. If you've not seen the bee, um, it's likely that you've at least seen the leaf pieces or the removal of leaf pieces from plants that these bees do to, to build their nests. And placing um, nests uh, that we've made for these bees in gardens is something that a lot of people have been doing in the last several years as interest in bee conservation, bee conservation has exploded. And I'll talk a little bit later on about some of the pros and cons of doing this and, and the, the best way to, um, to use these bee blocks in your garden. So I want to go on now and talk about bees and plants, because, of course, this is um, why we garden um, for bees is they need those plants for their food. The bees are vegans, so the pollen and the nectar that those plants provide are their food source. Um, we see a variety of different behaviors in bees as they attempt to utilize flowers. For example, that bumblebee on the left, when it, when it goes into a penstemon flower, it actually goes in upside down. And this gives it the best access um, to the, the um, nectar resources in that plant. I've also many times seen honeybees, as you see on the right on the bog sage, actually push open a flower that isn't opened yet to get inside to get at those resources. And I think the question of how bees find plants is one that just from a perspective as a scientist is really interesting, but has some practical applications for us in our gardens as well. And um, so when you think about a bee foraging outside in, in wherever, in your garden, um, in an agricultural field, 
it's a tremendously messy, noisy environment. Think about that tiny little insect and the center of the flower that it needs to find to get the pollen and the nectar resource. Um, it's kind of amazing when you think about it, how they manage to do that in all of the background noise of a busy environment uh, with roads and people and buildings and, and um, cars and all of that. So these are some of the, um, the cues or, or methods that bees have evolved to be able to efficiently find those resources. Uh, first is color. There are uh, bees, um, as you I'm sure know, see in the ultraviolet spectrum. So purple, yellow, and white are the colors that are most visible to bees. And this is used both as a long range cue as they're flying over an area, um, as well as, as when they move into a garden or other flower um, filled area to, to find food resources. So that color is used of a contrast um, between different colors, as well as how saturated the color is, are all important cues. And bees can quickly distinguish between different colors but distinguish between similar colors more slowly, which suggests that we might want to think about mixing colors in our garden to help it um, be something that would be more um, attractive to bees. And then of course, scent in those plants that are producing a nectar resource uh, is used both for long range and uh, close up food location. Other things are form, shape and contrast. Um, contrast, for example, um, bees, um, see green as dark. It essentially looks black to bees. And so when you think about a plant that's got a lot of green leaves with a small number of flowers on it, the, the fact that those leaves appear dark is really going to help the flowers stand out. And um, it's a, a, an adaptation that really helps bees to find those flowers. And then of course, because bees do see in the ultraviolet spectrum, flowers that are attractive to bees tend to have UV absorbing centers where the resources are and UV reflecting edges, again, to help direct bees right to where they need to be. Another thing that's really important in terms of garden design to help bees find plants um, are, is edge structure and linear gradients. And what I mean by this is bees tend to um, like to go to areas that are the border between two different types of plantings, which to them essentially appears as different types of textures. So for example, if you had a, um, a shrub border that had a turf lawn in front of it and you wanted to increase your plantings for bees, if you were to take out the area of turf, maybe two or three feet right in front of that shrub border and put the bee attracting flowers there, that's gonna be an edge between the just very distinctive shrubs and those flowering plants, the flowering perennials that bees are gonna use. And that's an area that they would be drawn to. And then uh, some of the ground nesting bees like bumblebees prefer to nest along linear gradients, such as fences or garden edges. Um, and I see this in my own garden with a lot of bees nesting, uh, the ground nesting bees uh, building their nests right along the border of pathways. And so here's some examples of some of the flower adaptations that really help the bees to hone in on just the area that they need. Nectar guides are one great example of this. Uh, those areas in the center of a flower that have some kind of a distinctive pattern, like you see on the left in the lower photo. These essentially serve as runway landing lights telling the bee, this is where you need to go to get that resource that you need. And an example of that ultraviolet um, appearance to nectar is shown on the right. That's a flannel bush, which is a yellow flower and to us appears just as a, a yellow um, with no real difference in color between the edges of the flower and the center. But when you look at it under ultraviolet light, as is the case in this photo, you can see that nectar in the center is fluorescing blue. And again, that serves as a real um, beacon for the bees to know exactly where they need to go. So of course, food is important in bee gardens, food in, in the form of flowers, um, but there are other things that bees need as well to make that garden as complete and healthy as possible for them. And these include water and shelter. And I, I wanna take a, a few minutes to look at all three of these components um, in more detail. So of course, food is the most important, that pollen and the nectar that bees need um, uh, for their growth and development. Um, and something that I'm often asked by garden visitors is 
well, aren't all flowers the same? I mean, I have something that blooms in my garden, isn't that good enough? And I think probably many of us know that, no, that's, unfortunately that is not the case. Flowers vary quite a bit in their nutrient value for bees, just like the food that we eat is quite variable and, and some foods are much more nutritious than others. There are some pollen that's much more uh, protein filled, some nectar that has a lot of um, much more sugar, much better secondary plant compounds that aid in bee health. And um, so all flowers, unfortunately, are not the same. And you really need to be a little bit discerning in terms of what you pick. And especially in the last five or so years as gardening for bees and people has become more of, uh, of interest to gardeners in general, and people are concerned about bee health and want to do something positive. There's a lot of bee lists that have been developed um, from garden centers, from plant breeders, uh, nursery growers. And unfortunately, the scientific basis behind these lists is not always clear. And there was a study done a few years ago by a group in Great Britain that looked at recommended bee plants um, on lists from around the world. And they found that there was quite a bit of variation even within the same region. So what I recommend to folks is to um, look at plant lists from sources that you know are trustworthy. Um, and here in California, both UC Berkeley and uh, us at UC Davis have published plant lists um, of material that we know we've evaluated for bee attractiveness and we know is going to be healthy for bees. And I would especially for those of you that are in the more coastal part of Humboldt, the Berkeley list I think is going to have some things that we don't have at the Haven that um, will be of, of interest to you. And so some other things to think about in putting together a mix of, of, of food in the form of flowers for your bees is to have a variety of plant families because plant family roughly corresponds to the nutrient value of a plant. Um, some families are like the mint family, for example, are only going to provide a nectar resource, but it's a very high quality nectar. Um, the um, sunflower family is going to provide both pollen and nectar. Um, so having that mix of plant families um, ensures both a mix of pollen and nectar, but also of a complete protein source and of a diverse nectar source. Continuous bloom is also important, of course, and flowers in different shapes, sizes, and colors are going to be important if you want to have a variety of bees and, and be supporting bees other than just honeybees in your garden. And a final consideration is to plant in clumps or drifts because this facilitates the, the plant finding process as well as the, the foraging process. So water is the other component um, that I think you all recognize is important for your honeybees. And um, uh, this is something that we have to often have to do a lot of education about because uh, for our visitors, because so many folks have learned that they need to keep the water in their bird baths very clean. That it's important to clean those bird baths out regularly for the health of the birds. And with bees, it's just the opposite. Bees actually prefer what we call dirty water. And this, coin, this phrase, dirty water, was first coined back in the 30s by a researcher who noticed he was studying bees on farms. And he noticed that the bees tended to drink from the pools of water that the cows had defecated in. Um, and he coined that phrase, dirty water. And since then, what we've learned is that organic material, be it the, the cow patties or leaf material or whatever that has fallen into a water source will leach out minerals. And that can be a valuable source of nutrition for bees. And in fact, recent research has shown that honeybees will go to a water source, depending on its mineral content, if the hive is deficient in that mineral. So the practical application of this um, in our bee gardens is to have a water source in, in the form of a, something fairly shallow, like a pot bottom, that you let the organic material like leaves accumulate in. And you can see on the right there, the water source in my own garden, I have some corks that are floating uh, in those pot bottoms and the algae accumulates on those and that's where the bees are drinking. Another way that we provide water in the haven is with the use of soaker hoses. Um, these slowly put out drops of water over time and we put these on a timer so they run during the hottest part of the day and the bees will drink from those as well. Uh, shelters are going to be important, of course, uh, for your honeybees, you're providing the shelter in, in the form of the hive. Um, but even for foraging honeybees, something like a dry stack uh, stone wall can be important when it's really hot out and they need to get some shade 
or early in the year when it's cool and the, the masonry wall is heating up faster uh, than the air around it. That could be a way to help that they can, as they're out foraging, they can use that heat um, to, to help keep them going. For our ground nesting bees, it's important to leave some bare ground in the garden. And uh, even if you are, are putting down pavers, try to space them widely and uh, set them in sand rather than in cement um, so that the, the bees have access to the ground. And then the carpenter bees can use old stumps and logs for nesting. So those are something to consider leaving in the garden as well. And this is an example of one of those ground, this is, happens to be a bumblebee nest entrance, but those ground nesting bee entrances are, are um, easy to miss. They're about the diameter of a pencil. Um, and um, if you, uh, but um, once you start looking, once you start knowing what to look for and going out in your garden, you will often find these. And then finally, the above ground shelter. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, placing these bee blocks or bee houses, or sometimes they're called bee condos in gardens is something that has become quite popular in the last few years. The bees that use these in the wild would use abandoned beetle galleries. And so we want to, as much as possible, mimic that same habitat when we put bee houses in the garden. So it's ideal if they're made out of wood, because of course that's what they'd be nesting in in the wild. And they should be stationary. I've seen them sold that swing off of a branch like a birdhouse, and the bees will tend to not use those. It's also important to have the cavity diameter correspond to the actual diameter of the, bee, the bees that we use them. And so for us here in California, uh, three, four, and five sixteenths of an inch are a good diameter. And so, as I mentioned, these are something that's become more and more popular in recent years. And, um, you know, as biologists, we have a bit of, con of a concern about that because as these get more and more concentrated in gardens, and you'll see people who have these bee condos with, with bee blocks that have hundreds of nesting holes in them, this is not the way that the bees would nest in the wild. And so we have some concerns about that. There was a nice study done a few years ago in Toronto that looked at 600 of these different bee hotels studied for three years. And what they found was that native wasps were more abundant than bees and used about three quarters of all of the blocks each year. And we found something similar at the Haven. In fact, we took down several of our bee blocks because the, um, the structures, the bee condo structures were simply serving as wasp nesting sites. Um, they also found um, higher rates of parasitism, the larger the bee hotel was. And this is really the concern when you have a, a group of insects massed together like this, the chance of dis disease spread increases. And so that's why in the wild, you'd only have a few bees nesting in an, in an entire tree. Um, and then interestingly, they also found that the native bee species were most abundant in the more residential sites and less so in the more densely um, situated urban parks and community gardens. And so uh, on the left there is one of the bee condos that was installed at the Haven when it was created. And this is the structure that I mentioned I took down because basically it was just serving as a, a wasp nesting site and it wasn't safe for visitors and the bees were not used in it as a result. Another thing to think about, um, you know, when we build these bee blocks, um, we place them so that the holes are, are hor or the, and the, the tunnels are horizontal, but bees fly and work in all dimensions. And so plant stems that are hollow can also be a nesting site. So when you're pruning things in the fall, if you've got plants like this sedum that have hollow stems, be sure to leave those um, about six inches in length and uh, the bees may uh, use them for, um, for nesting. And if they haven't used them by the following year, you can just break those off and, and pull them out. And then finally for shelter, uh, we want to think about plant material as well. Um, you all know the value of propolis. And so plant, uh, bees can use a gummy nectar um, or gummy sap in order to um, um, have propolis in their hives. Uh, one example of a plant that uh, provides this is coyote bush. Um, gum plant is another one that you may have heard of and very aptly describes the very gummy sap. And then, of course, plant material can also be used to construct nests for those um, leafcutter bees. There are some bees that will scrape the hairs off of lamb's ear. 
And then of course the uh, leaf cutter bees that will take those leaf pieces out of plants like red buds and roses to help build their nests. And so I wanna finish up now by talking about the work that we did at Davis um, to share with you some um, information about the plants that we're finding um, are most attractive to bees and, and give you some recommendations for your own gardens. Um, this was a study that it took place uh, nationwide and uh, we uh, did the work here in California along with the group down at um, Cooperative Extension in San Diego. And so we evaluated bees as either honeybees or other bees, so the, uh, the common native bees that you see here and assessed how likely they were to go to plants that are commonly planted uh, in our California gardens. And we did this both in replicated field plots as well as at the Honeybee Haven. And this is the information that I've provided to you on the handout because I know that looking at these tables um, on a computer screen can sometimes be a little bit difficult. So you've got those handouts as well to, um, to take a closer look at this data uh, at your convenience. Um, just a couple of things uh, stand out for this. There are certain plants, even though we did this over several years, um, we had pretty consistent results from year to year. And so there were certain plants that really stood out. And one of these is the Russian sage, the Porovskia, uh, which was either first, second, or third in terms of honeybee attractiveness, which is shown on the left-hand side of this first uh, chart. Um, another very um, attractive one was the catmint, um, the uh, nepeta, second, third, or fourth. Um, Gaura, what kind of a surprise, not a plant that uh, we tend to think of as being bee attractive, but in our studies it was. And then another genus that was very attractive was Tucrium, uh, the germander, which was either first or second in terms of attractiveness to honeybees in, in all of the years that we studied. And the um, a couple of things stand out when we then switch and look at the other bees, those native bees, is we have very different plants that were being the most attractive. Um, in the case of the other bees, the asters, our native aster the, in the genus uh, Cynthia trichum was the most attractive um, in the, each year of the study. And so this kind of highlights the need if you wanna have both honeybees as well as other bees in your garden, um, you really are not going to see the same plants being the most attractive to all bees. You really, do, really need to consider the needs of, of uh, the variety of bees that, that might be coming to your garden. And then pictured down below is, is an example of that, that replicated field plot. And then as I said, oops. we also uh, looked at this in the honeybee haven and we looked at a lot more plants um, at the Haven. We looked at over 35 different plants in the three years of the study um, and did find some pretty similar results. It's certainly with the honeybees, uh, that Nepeta, the catmint was very attractive as was the Russian sage, um, a plant that we did not have at the field plot that was very attractive in the garden was calamint, the genus Calamintha. And again, this is in the mint family. Um, so these are, are some things to consider, um, including in your, um, in your garden. And um, we are in the process of publishing this work. Um, I do have some of this information um, on our blog and um, I'll have a link to that at the, at the end of the presentation. And then pretty similar to what we found in the field plot, the bees that are the plants that are most attractive to the non-apis bees were different from the plants that were attractive um, to honeybees. And so one of the pieces of information, one of the um, handouts uh, that we developed from this is um, something that expresses the idea of bees per gallon. Um, water, of course, for us in California is a, a tremendously valuable resource. And uh, in our bee gardens, it's really valuable if we can get the most bang for the, the gallon, essentially. What are the plants that are going to use the least water, but will also be really attractive to bees? And these. Um, are the, the plants that I, based on these studies, um, these are the 10 plants that fall into that category. Um, and these are on your handouts as well. Um, so these would be some things to, to really think about including in your garden in terms of um, maximizing your water efficiency, but also bringing in lots of bees and providing good resources for them. And I wanna talk a little bit about some specific recommendations. Um, uh, for those of you who are in more coastal locations and get uh, much more rain 
um, than we do here in, in the uh, Sacramento region. These are some, some things that um, I would uh, recommend that you include in your garden. Um, the currants in the genus Ribes, we do have some of these that grow in the Central Valley, but you have a lot wider variety available to you in the more coastal locations. Uh, California bee plant is another one that's um, uh, very attractive to bees and does really well with the, the moisture that you have along the coast. The ornamental blackberries, um, Joe pie weed, um, rhododendrons, of course, um, the sneeze weeds or holenium, and then the asters. Um, and again, the asters we can grow in the Central Valley, but they do much better. And you have a, a wider array of them available to you um, along the, the coast where you get more rainfall. I also wanted to talk about plants that might be sensitive to hard frost. Um, for those of you who are perhaps in more elevated locations, um, the Cape balsam was very attractive to bees in our studies, um, but this is a South African native. Um, the Cedros Island verbena is native to the Channel Islands. And again, this is something that if you get sustained hard frost is going to die back. It grows very quickly. Some folks will grow it as an annual because of that. And then salvias are often um, sensitive to frost as well. Um, I'll just point out that the, the plant list um, of all of the plants that we have at the Haven, which is available on our website, does include the sunset growing zone. So that'll help you to, to pick out those ones. If you are in one of those more elevated locations, um, that'll help you to, to pick out ones that might not work for you. And then I also wanted to talk about annuals. Um, most folks, when they think of annuals, they think of bedding plant annuals, uh, such as you see in that landscape on the right. Um, we did not evaluate these in our study. Um, the folks in San Diego did, as well as some of the other teams in that nationwide project. And basically they found that most of those bedding plant annuals um, are not at all attractive to bees. Um, a couple of exceptions might be marigolds, um, zinnias are some things that are attractive, but what really does it for our bees here in California is our native wildflowers, like you see in this planting in, in um, the city of Davis on, on the left. And um, the good news is that many of these um, will regrow from seed and in fact, that's really the best way to grow these is to purchase native wildflower seed and to just sow that in the, um, in the fall when it starts to rain. And things like the, uh, the poppies and the phacelias, uh, the lupins, they will just keep reseeding year after year. And so um, you'll get this, uh, this great bloom that will support bees early in the year. And then I also want to, to talk about the idea of weeds as bee forage. Um, the mustards, for example, have a very high protein pollen and uh, the mustard is everywhere this time of year. And so it's something to think about as a, a great a food resource um, for bees. Uh, another question that comes up a lot in terms of selecting plants um, for the bee garden is whether or not native plants are needed for native bees. And there's been a number of studies that have looked at this question and in general, the results have been pretty mixed in what we would be considered disturbed habitats like our gardens and farms. And in many cases, um, there are examples where gardens that have included many non-native plants actually are better for native bees because they extend the flowering period. Um, and most of the bees that we see in our gardens are general feeders. And I think you all know your honeybees are probably at the top of that list in terms of the wide range of, of things that they will forage on. Um, we do have a couple of specialist bees that we see in urban gardens like the Diadasia uh, genus, and they will feed on plants in, uh, in the mallows like Spiralsia, but that's really the exception um, in our bee gardens. And then the final consideration is the, the shape of the flower. Um, the plant breeders like to make things that look wild and crazy, like that echinacea you see on the right. Um, but unfortunately, all of those extra petals come at the expense of the, the stamen, the pollen bearing structure. Um, so the same tissue that gives a rise, that rise, gives rise to these stamens and all the, that healthy pollen for our bees is what gives rise to all those petals. So we really wanna keep it simple in terms of selecting flowers for bees. And then finally, I'll mention that um, the student intern who worked on our research project for the last two years was a landscape architecture major and she has graduated and gone on to Caltrans 
but she's come up with some planting plans for those of you who feel like you need some help getting started in picking plants and, so, and placing them in your bee garden. And uh, she's developed some planting plans that you can download from our website. They include both a schematic like this, as well as a, a plant list with some information about when it blooms, the bees you'll likely, to likely see on them, et cetera. So that can help you get, if you're not sure where to get started. So that is um, the end of the presentation. It looks like we've got quite a number of um, questions in the chat. So I'm gonna stop my screen sharing and go ahead and open the chat. Okay, so we've got the, as someone mentioned, they noticed bees drinking out of the water of potted, the bottom of the potted plants after there was some water accumulating in there. Yeah, those, those pot bottoms are perfect water source. They're just the right height for bees. Um, and um, yeah, as, as someone else says, there probably is a higher mineral content in that water because of uh, nutrients that would be running out of the soil. Um, okay, question about minimizing spiders in those native bee houses. Um, yes, we do, we do see spider webs um, in the, uh, at the Honey Bee Haven. Um, and you know, spiders will eat bees, but spiders are also valuable um, predators in the garden as well. And um, there really isn't anything that you can do to your native bee house to prevent spiders from um, nesting in that area other than to you know, destroy the web every time you see it. Um, looks like that is it in the chat. Oh, here we go, let's see. Um, any bee forage plants also evaluated against other pests like deer resistance. Yeah, we did, we did not evaluate that. Um, something that I would love to do if I get the time is to um, kind of do some cross listing. One thing I'm working on now, for example, is making a cross list between fire resistant plants and bee attractive plants uh, for folks who, who need both of those as they put together their landscape. Um, and honestly, my opinion about deer resistance is that deer, if deer are hungry, they'll eat anything. Um, and fencing is really um, the, um, oh, and I love this question about ceanothus. Um, ceanothus is um, a very promiscuous plant. And um, that's actually a botanical term <laughs> that refers to plants that will very readily cross between different species within the genus. And um, if you, any of you who are avid native plant gardeners and may know the book called Ceanothus will recognize the literally hundreds of Ceanothus cultivars that are in the nursery trade as the result of this natural cross pollination. And um, the bees will absolutely cross pollinate your blue and your white Ceanothus. And um, I have some Ceanothus seedlings that have popped up in my garden in recent years and I've replanted all of them because I'm dying to see if I get something interesting out of them. Any other questions? I have a question. So besides color, um, what else can draw a bee into a flower? Can, I was reading somewhere long ago that, that flowers put off like magnetic fields and when a bee lands on it, the magnetic field of the flower changes and other bees can pick up on that. Is that just some... I don't know anything about magnetic fields. I do know that what, what can happen is um, when bees forage on a flower, they have scent glands in their legs that leave a scent behind that tells other bees that a, that, that flower has just been foraged on and there's no point in trying to land there because you won't get anything. And so if you watch carefully, as you'll see bees in a garden, they may approach a flower and you'll see them sort of hover for a second and then turn away likely what's happening is they are sensing that cue that somebody else has just been there and that there's nothing there to forage on right now. Right, thank you. Okay, some other questions here. Recommendations for minimum planting bed size for different families of plants. Um, so, you know, there was a recommendation that came out of UC Berkeley um, for um, a minimum size of a plant patch of 10 square feet. Um, there's been other work that has shown that that's not necessarily needed. And um, the most important thing is to plant something and not worry so much about 
the exact size. Um, those planting plans that I mentioned we have on our website um, do indicate the size of a plant patch based on, um, I think it's a 50 by 80 yard. So you can extrapolate from that, but there's, there's lots of information about the size of plants and how big they will get um, available in, in good garden references. Um, so Areogonum, um, the Areogonum was very attractive to bees um, in our studies. And definitely one I would recommend. And what's neat about Areogonum is that it was attractive to bees, but it's also attractive, it's probably the single most attractive plant to a, the widest variety of insects in a garden. And so you'll get butterflies, moths, you'll get beneficial insects coming to it. So it's really great um, for that as well. Um, yeah, and so the question was about blueberry plants um, and their pollination. And that is correct. Um, honeybees, um, the uh, ericaceous plants are certainly the ones that have that flower structure like the blueberry are difficult for honeybees to get nectar from. And there are other bees that will pollinate blueberries more. Blueberry, uh, honeybees are, are brought to commercial blueberries for pollination, but they're not the best pollinator um, for, for, for blueberries, for sure. Christine, can I add to that? Thank you very much, because I got, I've been watching it, and I was saying, oh, my blueberry is going to get really pollinated by the bees. Uh-uh. I never saw a honeybee in any of the flowers, but bumblebee, yeah. they love uh, it. The bee, the bee that um, you might want to try to attract is the blue orchard bee, and that's one of those cavity nesting bees. So you might want to think about putting some of those, those bee houses um, in your garden. And so then the next question is, do bees tend to visit different types of, different types of the same species of plant during a single forage? So bee, the bees, um, so honeybees definitely, I think, as you know, will go to one, one species per, per foraging trip. Um, and that's true with most bees. Um, bumblebees sometimes will go to different flowers, but generally bees will stick with one species per foraging trip. I was wondering, add a clarification with that question. So like if there's like a couple different ribes out, would a bee likely visit, like if there's like a, I don't know, a red current and a, a diff just different types, would they visit all of them maybe in a trip or they would just stick with one I think they're gonna tend to stick to just, I think they're gonna stick to just one, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is one of the ideas behind that planting in patches. Cause you've got, you know, you'll have everything they need in that one spot. Um, and so the question about getting copies of the, the plant recommended plants, it's all on our website. Um, so that's beegarden.ucdavis.edu. And um, if you go to, there's a tab on the, on the website that's called resources and all the plant lists are under there. Um, let's see, many honeybees on, honeybees on huckleberry. Um, cover crops. Um, we like to do mustard cover crops at the Haven um, because mustard, you know, has that high protein um, pollen and, um, you know, grows readily from seed. Uh, California poppy is another one. California poppy um, is only going to provide a pollen resource, but of course, because it, it blooms early in the year and pollen is what's needed early in the year, um, that's great as well. Awesome. Any more questions? Um, I'm kind of, I'm so curious about bee pollen and proteins and the complete, you know, having a complete diet, but I, I, it's like a deep dive into this other world that I'm not sure I want to go there. You know, and that, 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 that's a great, um, a great question and, you know, a really open area of research. There's been some work done years and years ago looking at the protein content of, um, of mostly weeds. You know, this work was done back when we were really thinking about honeybees in agricultural settings. So there is some information out there about some weed species that would be typical around farms. Um, but I think a great study would be to look at, at these plants that we've identified as being quite attractive and look at the, look at the, the pollen and see, see what, 
amino acids are in that in that pollen? And, you know, are they getting complete protein by feeding on these? Um, Christine, I have a question on the Cianotus. Here on the coast, we have what we call dark star. I think that's a variety. It has real mm -hmm. tiny leaves. Uh, my bees yes. love that. It's unbelievable. I would yeah. have. Is it a good nutrient? Dark, uh, any Cianotus is, it's, any Cianotus is great for bees. Cianotus are a great bee plant. Dark star does better on the coast. Um, there's a close relative called Julia Phelps that we grow more inland, but dark stars are, yeah. Um, and you can really um, get a whole, um, there's a species called Ceanothus maritimus, which as the name suggests is a coastal species. It's one of the first to bloom. Um, and you can really get a whole, um, you can get them blooming from about January uh, through to um, May, if you, you know, have enough of the different varieties. Um, so definitely Ceanothus are definitely a, a great choice for a bee garden. Um, I see something here about willow pollen. Willows are, um, are wind pollinated. Wind pollinated plants tend to have very small pollen because it needs to be light so that the wind will pick it up. And a consequence of being very light means that it doesn't have a lot of protein in it. So generally wind pollinated plants don't provide a lot of nutrient nutrition in their pollen for bees. Uh, any other questions? Mm. Any more questions? I had a question that um, a few years ago, I found a resource but didn't write it down about the color of pollen. And uh, there was a chart or a book that was helpful to people who aren't scientists, but just casual beekeepers to determine which um, pollens are coming in. You might be able to ID <clears throat> it by based on what you see in that's blooming, but I've, I'm always curious to see what they're bringing in. I have a curiosity of what is it that they're bringing in? Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with what book that is, but yeah, that, that's because obviously their pollen comes in a variety of colors right. for sure. And it's really yeah. interesting to see those different colors in the hive. Sometimes you can see in the um, comb different colors, like there'll be a, mm -hmm. a purple yep. spot or a red spot. Yeah, um, it's, it's really interesting to see that. Yeah. Uh, someone mentioned corn. Again, corn is wind pollinated. You will see bees on corn sometimes, um, but again, it's wind, something that's wind pollinated. It's not really a, a, a high quality um, food source. When you see lots of bees on the corn, does that mean that there's not a whole lot else out there? Yeah, typically, you know, it's think, think about it. If, if the only place you had to eat was McDonald's, you'd eat at McDonald's. Yeah. If you have a choice of a farmer's market and the Whole Foods and the Safeway, and you know, you, you might not go to McDonald's. So it's, yeah, <laughs> sometimes they will feed on lesser quality um, uh, plants if there is nothing else. Well, thank you so much, Christine. Sure. Yep, and wonderful really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Zoom clap. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that's great information. I've taken a lot of notes. I sure appreciate it. Yeah, I hope you'll all be able to get down to the Haven sometime. I know it's a bit of a trip for you all, but. Oh, that'd be fun. Yeah. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Christine. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Christine. Have a good Thank evening. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Okay, I'm stopping the recording. Stop.